use of chlorpyrifos on those three crops. And you can see where the peaks are, and I think we can probably begin to get a discussion going. Why is it peaking at that particular area? I know why it's peaking at that area. I know what I'm treating. But we're, um, we're going to bring a blue screen here, Larry. There we go. Oh. Did everybody put their, um, their rapid ticket in the basket? I didn't get a rapid ticket. No, you keep them. That's the other half of the apple tippet. No, but the ones that, do they put their half? Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, everybody did. <coughs> All right, are we ready to do something? You want to draw first? Uh, are, well, are you ready to go? Well, let's go ahead. Go ahead, why don't you go ahead and uh, contain fire. We're just going to... Oh, we need to bring the lights up again. We're not quite ready. Okay. okay. All right, go ahead, Larry. Thank you. Right, just uh, give you a brief update on, on the situation, cotton and cotton IPM. Uh, you've all heard me before, so you probably have heard, heard some of this before. But basically in cotton, the situation over the last uh, 15 years has changed a lot here in the Valley. Uh, the most obvious thing is, you know, cotton isn't necessarily the big player anymore in terms of acreage. Uh, you know, cotton in many areas is a uh, uh, much smaller acreage certainly than it was and, and you know, and influenced by other crops instead of being the key influencer in a lot of areas. The other big change is uh, EVA cotton production has uh, taken over the San Joaquin Valley, about 55% is now EVA cotton. And then there's an increased uh, importance placed on lint quality. It's always been important, but now it's really uh, ramped up in terms of how, how lint quality uh, is stressed. Uh, cotton production, I'm maybe talking about San Joaquin Valley. There's also uh, 18,000 or so down in Southern California, uh, 4,000 up in Sac uh, Sacramento Valley. But obviously the, the vast uh, production of cotton is, is in San Joaquin Valley. In terms of the pests that we're dealing with, and I'll go through each of these in a little bit of detail, uh, show the management for each of these. Uh, what, and this is more or less, I uh, would see them throughout the production season, uh, starting out with western flower thrips, then moving to uh, ligus bugs, uh, western tarnish plant bug being the official name for it. Uh, three different species of spider mites, cotton aphid, bee darning worm, and then silver leaf white fly, uh, usually as a end of the season uh, type of problem. So starting with uh, western flower thrips, uh, these can be present all year, but in cotton we really only are concerned about it for about the first month during the season. Uh, once the uh, you know, weather really heats up, western fire trip populations uh, crash. Um, they can do damage during that first month. This shows some terminal damage, uh, shows some uh, untreated plants that are pretty uh, pretty nicked up with western fire thrips compared to some treated, treated plants. But again, once those environmental conditions uh, turn good for cotton, cotton just outgrows the damage from western flower thrips. Uh, in terms of management, usually for western flower thrips, nothing. We really don't really need to do anything. And we really discourage management because uh, western flower thrips are, are a predator. So they feed on the plant, but they also feed on spider mites, particularly spider mite eggs. And quite frankly, spider mites are a much more significant pest than western flower thrips. So we appreciate that free control that we get of spider mites from, from the thrips. Also, uh, much of the cotton is planted, most of it has uh, orthene seed treatment. So in, in a sense, we are treating for western flower thrips, but it's with that small amount of orthene that's on the seed. It gives about two weeks control, helps to get the cotton up out of the ground. If we need a, a foliar treatment, we have this reduced risk product that's available for a foliar application. And then we also rely on some of the old organophosphates, uh, dimethoate uh, in particular. But for the most part, we don't really have to do anything uh, for, for western flower thrips. Moving to the second pest during the season, that would be ligus bugs. Uh, this is the primary one that uh, uh, cotton growers uh, deal with every year. Uh, damage from ligus bugs is shown here, feeding on the, the flower bugs, the squares, causing those squares to abort. You don't have the squares, you're not going to produce any lint. And the uh, uh, ligus bug can also feed on small bowls, and that uh, stains, uh, stains the cotton lint once, uh, once that bowl matures. So that's really the two types of damage that ligus bugs can, can do. Uh, ligus bug populations are certainly not uniform, uniform in the valley. They're very spotty. 
Uh, they can move out of foothill areas. They can move out of the uh, uh, middles between some of the perennial crops. And they can move out of other uh, angle crops like safflower. So it really depends on where your cotton field is as to how severe livestock population populations might, might be. We have well-developed sampling protocols for ligus bugs that have been developed over the last 30, 40 years. We have well-developed thresholds for ligus bugs, but those are mostly applicable to upland cotton. We really haven't done similar research on peanut cotton over the last 10 years or so. So that's one void that we have. And I would say that in the last uh, three or four years, the management uh, has, for this pest is more intensive now. That's supported by some research that's that's been done recently, but uh, quite frankly, we are treating at lower populations now than we used to. So, uh, ligus bugs have taken on a, an elevated uh, pest status, and we are treating more more vigorously for them. In terms of uh, management for ligus bugs, biological control really isn't uh, that that useful, that applicable. Host plant resistance doesn't exist in our cotton varieties. Uh, pheromones or other type of uh, soft approaches, really not applicable. Uh, crop management is very important, you know, growing a bigger seed, growing cotton crop, as well as uh, managing your neighboring crops to prevent movement of ligus bugs into cotton, movement from alfalfa, safflower, etc. If you have to move to insecticides, there are several options. Uh, Carbine is a new product, clonicamid, that's been on the market for about five years, uh, very effective. Pyrethroids, several pyrethroids are used. Uh, there's one carbamate, that's a very important product for the cotton industry, but a bite eight for lichen bugs. Organophosphates, some use, but, but not really so much. Uh, for the most part, not terribly effective against lichen bugs. And then a few other products that might get a little use for lichen. Uh, pyrethroids used to be the standard, but as you saw, it's uh, somewhat down the list now. Uh, that's due to resistance that ligus bugs have developed for, to pyrethroids. And uh, pyrethroids were also very disruptive in terms of IPM. So we, uh, in terms of moving away from them to some softer products like carbine, flumnicament, <coughs> that's definitely helped uh, IPM to, uh, IPM and cotton to move away from some of the pyrethroids. Moving to the next pest, spider mites can be present during any part of the season, but usually June, July is when spider mites really build up. Uh, spider mite uh, feeding can cause the leaves or parts of leaves to turn red, yellow, and then eventually uh, defoliate. And uh, you can see the results of some uh, spider mite feeding in, in this picture. We have a well-developed sampling program for spider mites. It's a presence absence sampling program. You don't actually have to count the mites, which is very fortunate since they're so small. We have thresholds that are available and, and used by growers. And growers really respect the damage that spider mites can do, you know, they, they, you know, spider mites can build up very fast and quickly defoliate cotton, so it's a, it's a pest that's paid a lot of attention to. There are several pesticides that are registered that provide uh, good control of spider mites. The issue being uh, pesticide resistance, which, which does the best develop. This is just data from one year where uh, you can see about a $40 application of uh, effective material against spider mites to be used for prevent about a $550 loss. So it's hard to say in this case that uh, you don't have a positive uh, effect from, from controlling spider mites in, in cotton. In terms of uh, materials that are used, uh, growers used to rely on these two older miticides, propargite and dicopol. Uh, resistance uh, became an issue with these products. Control was, was fairly erratic. Uh, Avalectin came on the market in the mid-1990s and has been used. It was initially very expensive, but it is a very effective product. It's now off patent, so it's cheaper. And then there was a suite of new uh, miticide that came on the market in the early 2000s uh, in cotton. These are the two that are really shaking out as being uh, useful in cotton, with this one being uh, used uh, very extensively in cotton. But the good thing is uh, Avamectin, now about uh, 20 years old, it's still an effective product, so we really haven't lost that product to resistance in cotton. Uh, it's still an effective uh, material for mites. Uh, cotton aphid is a, is a pest that's become an issue over the last 20 years or so. In the 1980s, I wasn't here, but reading the literature, uh, cotton aphid really wasn't a pest of cotton at all. It was present in fields, but not really something you had to be concerned about. Uh, about the time I came to California, 
cotton aping was an early season pest, so I'm talking about seedling stage cotton like this. Uh, then in the late 1990s, cotton aphid became a mid-season pest, and we saw populations of like, like this on leaves of cotton in July, uh, early August. Then in the early 2000s, cotton aphid became a late-season pest, and the situation with late-season uh, cotton aphids is it leads to, to sticky cotton. Honeydew from the aphids is deposited on the bowls, and that leads to sticky cotton. And now I'd say that we deal with cotton aphid both during the mid-season in the late season period. This early season situation really isn't a uh, factor anymore, but mid and late season aphids definitely are a factor. Cotton aphid exists in several different forms or different uh, color morphs. In terms of uh, thresholds for cotton aphid and how we manage yeah. it, again, the early season uh, situation isn't really around anymore, but the work that we did when it did appear in California early season cotton showed that basically early season aphids didn't affect the plant. It might stunt the plant initially, but the cotton uh, would outgrow it uh, as you move throughout the season. Uh, during the middle part of the season, say July, early August, the aphids uh, compete with the bowls for photosynthesis for energy, and we developed a threshold for treatment of about 50 aphids per leaf. And then during the end of the season, the aphids are definitely a problem in that they deposit honeydew on the exposed lint on the bowls, and that, as I mentioned, creates a situation called sticky cotton. Uh, threshold for that in upland cotton is about five to 10 aphids per leaf. So it really just takes a trace of aphids to potentially give you sticky cotton. On peanut cotton, you're never really able to develop a threshold. It was, uh, the re research results just would not support a threshold, but on upland cotton, you know, five to 10 aphids would, would create a problem with sticky cotton. And this, uh, again, just shows uh, the situation with sticky cotton. What is the importance of sticky cotton? Uh, basically, it's a problem with, with ginning the cotton, problem with the textile mill, and the amount of stickiness isn't really quantifiable. So when you market your cotton, you're not gonna get docked for it necessarily because of stickiness, because it's not easy, something that's easily quantifiable. But you are gonna get docked when the whole valley gets the reputation of producing sticky cotton. So whether or not you produce it or not, when the valley, when the production area gets a, a reputation for sticky cotton, then everyone is nipped in terms of uh, potential price deduction. So, you know, that's the situation with sticky cotton is really just damaging the reputation of a, of a valley or, or a production region. In terms of uh, managing cotton aphids, really the critical period is when we move from this mid season period of July with a threshold of about 50 aphids to a late season period, September, with a threshold of 5 to 10 aphids. And exactly when you switch from 50 to 5 to 10 is a bit up in the air. So this causes growers to really manage aphids aggressively during this period, uh, end of July, early, early August. And um, again, they're trying to prevent the sticky problem. So you know, aggressive management is, is something that is uh, supported in that regard. In terms of uh, materials that are used, uh, Neonicotinoids, primarily a sale, uh, is used uh, during this mid and late season period. There are problems with resistance in the uh, southern U.S. This plastic chemistry really doesn't work at all anymore against cotton aphids. Aphids are totally resistant to it. So that's certainly a problem. We haven't seen that yet in California, but it is a concern. This is also the window where uh, Boris Band 40 is a, a commonly used product. Uh, the cotton plant during this part of the year is fairly large. Applications have to be made by air, and uh, the Lavoris band has the ability to fume. The aphids occur on the underside of the leaves, so it just helps to get the material to the aphids that they are on the underside of the leaves. So, you know, this is one window where the growers have pointed out that Lavoris band is a critical product. There are other organophosphates that might be used, so I'm at the way you being one. Uh, Carbine, the material that I talked about with ligand spuds, is also effective on aphids but it's been used earlier in the season for ligus bugs, and we really don't like to see it used again during this period uh, for the possibility of developing resistance. If you use it you know, once, two, three, four times during the year, you're just asking, asking for resistance to develop. Endosulfan used to be a product that's used. It's no longer available. Uh, Belay, another neonicotinoid, was a product that was used for one year, but it's being uh, been phased out because of honeybee concerns. So those are two products that might be used but have been lost. 
And then just to finish up with uh, silver leaf white fly, uh, this is uh, an insect that uh, has been uh, a problem for the last 10 or 15 years. Primarily a problem at the southern end of the valley, uh, the eastern end of the valley, and then near urban areas, near uh, Visalia or near uh, Hanford, Corcoran, whatever. And again, it's a late season problem. Sticky cotton is the issue with uh, silver leaf white fly. In terms of uh, management for this pest, uh, if you happen to get it, say in July, there are reduced risk products and set growth regulators that can be used. We don't typically see silver leaf white fly in July. We typically see it at the end of the season in September. And during that part of the season, if you're not looking for long-term control that these products might, might provide, you're looking for something to knock down the adults and to prevent deposition of honeydew. And uh, pyrethroids are used, but the best product seems to be a pyrethroid plus an organophosphate or a carbamate. And again, chlorophyrophos is one of the products that is often combined with pyrethroid for this late season uh, uh, silver leaf white fly uh, control. Uh, why would you use chlorophyrophos? It also controls aphids as well as white flies, and this usually a mixture of both of those pests uh, at, the, at the end of the season. So this is another uh, uh, window where growers have uh, pointed out that the product is uh, very useful in cotton. So that's a quick summary of uh, cotton. I see Pete looking at his watch, so I'll probably use my time and make it a little bit more. Well, I do have I do have one question before okay. we, because I'd like to have take a little time at the end where there's discussion about the multiple crops when this particular product, the prior fossil, is being used. But you basically pointed out that it is primarily used against an August September situation against the uh, an, against the aphid Avis, that is really a wave and white fly that really affecting the quality, not necessarily the quantity, but almost but the quality of it. If we look at our we look at our graph on our average, and certainly that seems to be the peak of it is used in that area. One of the things you noted was that there wasn't a good threshold set up for Pima cotton, which is our pr primary acreage now. Do you know, or now I'm going to open up to a question, do you know or does, does anyone feel like there's a lot of a lot of risk aversion going on that, that no aphid in the field because I don't want a sticky reputation, I don't want any sticky cotton, uh, there's no threshold to guide me, uh, is part of the reason why we've seen a little bit of buildup, a little bit more use over the last several years of papyrophos in, uh, in, 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 in cotton. I was kind of throwing this out to a question now because it's a question we're going to be asking. I think <clears throat> the main reason for Pima is roller jib. And that roller jib and that leather belt, that accumulation of those sugars is just tough to jib. I understand that. So does that mean everybody's basically saying, you know, we're going to see one acre, we're going to treat the field kind yeah, of thing? Yeah, it's just tough to jib. So. What's that? It's tough to jib, so you don't want to get in that arena. Right, where so they can't then gin I'm your going cotton. to go into a very strong risk aversion to say, since there isn't a threshold, one even too many, I'm going to spray it. I mean, I'm trying to seek a reason why we're seeing kind of an increase in it. And, uh, that's one of the reasons. Well, I just thought, man, that's why no threshold, because you just, just tough to gin. Saw gin will lead you to get it through. Well, there was no threshold because they couldn't establish it. Yeah. They yeah, never found a relationship. Oh. And that was the, the real problem. That was possibly due because it's a very difficult study to do. Gary, did you ever hand that? I had a comment. I, is the type of leaf on the Pima something that the aphid doesn't like? No, I think it likes it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, the leaf is uh, a bit hairy, a bit uh, yeah. pubescent, and uh, they uh, they seem to do do well on it. Mites don't do as well on Pima cotton, but certainly aphids. Uh, the sale is starting to break down for us out there, yeah. and now we're starting to see the shift to go back to work. Then. Really? Yeah. And would you be using a sale in that August period? Yeah. Yeah, okay, so that might be a good reason. Like I say, it was real high in 2006, it dropped down and began to climb up over the last couple of years. That may be. Yes? Just a brief comment. I think that I'd be, uh, I understand what they're getting at, and I'm not going to say a sticky cotton is a reputation issue. Um, is um, being extremely polite yeah. because sticky cotton is not just a reputation issue. It's where men will start asking questions and where did this come from um, so we can identify where we need to be careful to buy our cotton. Exactly. So, and, and with everything on the market reputation, yeah. it's not a market issue. And I, think, and I think you're emphasizing the point that it's particularly without a guideline, people are going to be very, very cautious 
And at that time of year, this is, you know, that's the product that does really well and fumes really well to get in that canopy. So that's kind of the, the scenario I was trying to set to and, and uh, appreciate those, uh, those comments. Especially with the quality standard that's been set for Pima. I mean, that's what it's marketed on is the, the fine, fineness of the fiber and the quality of the fiber. And, uh, well, I mean, if we can get, uh, uh, if there's even a rumor of sweet cotton, uh, the phone's good reading from the wheels and gins talking about the last time we dealt with this, we replaced uh, whole sectors of equipment and stuff. And so it's a it's a very real big issue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Larry.